Oh, oh, welcome back to uh, a, a special Majestic Simpkins School of Human Rights Sunday session. Uh, today, we are pleased and honored to welcome Dr. Jennifer Taylor of the King University to join us this afternoon. Uh, she is uh, not only a public historian, but also an expert in understanding the, the ideology of the lost cause, which relates a lot to today's talk. Dr. Taylor is also a graduate of the University of South Carolina's PhD program, and I'm also honored to consider her a dear friend of mine. So, Dr. Taylor, welcome to today's session, and the floor is yours. Thank you so much. I am uh, going to do a screen share and dive right in today because usually there's some questions and I want to make sure we have time to uh, discuss everything today. Uh, but to just tell you a little bit about myself, um, I worked at the Woodrow Wilson family home uh, the last couple of years that I was in Columbia getting my PhD, uh, which is now the Museum of the Reconstruction Era. So what I'm going to talk to you about today is, is sort of what I've been thinking about um, in my year and a half as lead facilitator there, um, I'm also finishing up my manuscript about the home um, as a, a test, uh, a case study for how we can talk about issues like white supremacy um, and even reconstruction uh, in our public settings and in our museums and, and other similar sites. So that's where my head's been the last few years and uh, particularly after January 6th, I started making new connections. So uh, what I'm gonna talk to you about today is something I've been putting together uh, since 2021 and, and trying to reconcile these things that seemed connected, but, you know, I wasn't quite sure I could put my finger on exactly how until I just sat down about the business of doing it. So I am going to screen share a quick PowerPoint with you all. Move this bar just for a second. I'm going to minimize the crowd. Does that work well for everybody? Now yes, that I, it's perfect. Yeah, I was going to say now that I've minimized everyone. I yeah, can't. this works. <laughs> okay. Um, and, and maybe I'll leave a little bit of this up to the side and, and diminish as we need to. Uh, feel free to, to put questions as we go into the chats. And um, when I do cite somebody, I, I know Dr. Green's always fantastic about dropping things in there. So I suspect he'll, he'll, he'll keep up with me um, as we get going today. Um, I am on social media. Um, feel free to follow me on Twitter or on Instagram. I'm happy to continue the conversation there. Um, and you can always email me at Duquesne if you have anything you want to follow up with um, and discuss. So today we're going to talk about From Red Shirts to Proud Boys. It's a catchy title. Museum Artifacts, White Domestic Terror, and Election Fraud. So I, I think that these images here um, that you're seeing are, are pretty famous at this point, or at least something familiar to you all. Um, particularly the one of Trump, I think on the left, um, meeting before this, this sort of sad and, and tumultuous day on January 6th. So, um, our, we know on, um, January 13th, uh, about a week later, 2021, during the U S house of representatives debate, impeaching president Donald Trump for an extraordinary second time. Speaker of the House Nancy Pelosi called the insurrectionist who stormed the Capitol on January 6th domestic terrorists. Thousands left Trump's fiery speech that morning of January 6th, embracing his final words to, quote, walk down Pennsylvania Avenue, end quote, to give weak Republicans the encouragement needed to take back our country. Uh, some pow uh, protesters exited believing that he was accompanying them. He promised, after all, I'll be there with you. A 2000 person police force, most of whom lacked riot gear, unsuccessfully met the rally attendees turned insurrectionists who penetrated the legislative cham chambers to disrupt the official count of the electoral votes for the president elect Joe Biden. Paramilitary forces roamed a maze of hallways in search of Vice President Mike Pence and Speaker Pelosi. Among the weapons present that day were pipe bombs, zip ties, Molotov cocktails, and semi-automatic rifles. 
The mob mostly unmasked due to COVID-19 conspiracy theories. I always kind of found an irony in this that you could have actually asked yourself, but chose not to because of that. Um, stole electronics, trashed offices, and literally put their feet up, making themselves at home while members of Congress hit or fled for their lives. At the height of the violence, Capitol Police shot Ashley Babbitt as she attempted to breach the House chamber and rioters bludgeoned Officer Brian D. Sicknick to death with a fire extinguisher. Two other rioters died of separate medical emergencies and a total of five people lost their lives as a result of the infamous day's events. So to meet this moment and address the homegrown domestic terror on display January 6th, the United States finally will be forced to reconcile its long history of militant white supremacy. So how do we conduct this conversation? That's what I'm interested in. And I think artifacts and material culture from the Reconstruction Era period can help us do that. They can help us better understand the larger paramilitary forces shaping modern white supremacy and right-wing militancy. These objects offer concrete examples from history that are recognizable today, including federal and state responses that failed to stop white supremacist violence and political fraud. So I am going to move this guy over here. This is a, a pretty famous uh, image. If you don't know Thomas Nash, you do know Thomas Nash. Um, he is the creator of, um, you know, Santa Claus as you know him, um, only he was in a green suit. Um, a lot of the political cartoons you see out of the 19th century are Thomas Nass. And this is one of the most famous from the Reconstruction era. In fact, you can see a really early reference here um, to the lost cause if you look just above the skull. So I wanna give you all a minute and just take a look at this cartoon and what can you tell me about the paramilitary forces pictured? So um, hit me up in the chat. Um, I don't know if we have microphones enabled, so I, I won't ask that unless um, that's something we normally do, but just kind of take a look here from this 19, uh, 1874 image. You can always come back to this at the Library of Congress later if it's something you'd like to discuss with others. And this is an image um, not only popular uh, when discussing Reconstruction, but it is one featured in the Museum of the Reconstruction Era in Columbia. So I'm going to open chat here. Nothing. That's fine. We can think to ourselves too, and you can keep adding to the chat as we go. I think one of the things you probably are noticing um, are two different kinds of paramilitary groups here, right? Uh, there is a lynching in the back, absolutely, Cecil. We can see that right here. So the violence of Reconstruction. Uh, while we do see lynching increase in Jim Crow, uh, certainly it was something that happened during Reconstruction. We have the recognizable clan on the right, of course, and then maybe a lesser known group, uh, the White League on the left. Um, the schoolhouse sign, that's a great point, Cecil, and what is under uh, the woman's knees here. Um, so one of the things that we know happened with frequency during Reconstruction was attack on Black education. And of course, public schools are a byproduct of Reconstruction, and they were often targeted for domestic violence, uh, domestic terror. Um, and um, and whether that was a school that treated white and black students, um, this idea of education was considered a threat. And that kind of brings us to the bottom here where you can see the A, B, C, D, uh, what is probably a primer. I've always assumed this was blood. And of course, the question that's really difficult to grapple with is, you know, is this child um, dead? Is it, is it sleeping? Um, you know, really hard questions uh, to ask. Oh, yeah, Greg saying the blood of the children. Yeah, that's what I think it is um, as well. Oh, sorry. And then, of course, we can see this language worse than slavery, the idea that you have freedom, but you are still heavily restricted by the use of violence with white paramilitary groups. And we get a lot of white supremacy cues here, not just the lost cause, but the union as it was this is a white man's government. Um, and you can see that factors into the title here as well. So we were talking about domestic violence um, and domestic terrorism. 
early um, in our history. This is not a new phenomenon. Yeah, unified terror. I think that's a great way to think about it, Kim. And so I, I have been able to um, gain access to a series of red shirt artifacts. So I'm not going to assume that everyone knows who the red shirts are. So give you a brief definition here. The red shirts were a paramilitary force that emerges in 1876 in the political campaign that ultimately will make uh, Wade Hampton the third governor, uh, what is called the Redeemer governor. And this is essentially the election that ends reconstruction as a biracial democratic process working on these questions of free labor that emerge after the Civil War. And so uh, the red shirts are a very particular group uh, that were located in South Carolina. They do trickle over to state borders from time to time. For example, in what we believe until January 6 is the only coup d'etat, at least this one was successful in 1898 in Wilmington, North Carolina. It does appear like the red shirts crossed the border and voted illegally in that election um, uh, several decades after uh, this 1876 campaign. But the reason they're called the red shirts are exactly what you imagine. They wore red shirts as their uniform. So I'm going to cycle through a series of images of red shirts. They're from a variety of institutions. Some of them are from the Moore, others from uh, the State Museum. Uh, and I want you to just tell me what you notice about the costuming itself or anything that strikes you about the red shirt and the, the uniform that would have been worn here. One of the questions that a docent asked at the more that I just kind of fell in love with and I talk about it in my book is if you're looking here on the red shirt on loan at the more, you can see these stains. And so uh, this docent would turn that question back on the visitor and say, what do you think those stains are? Is it blood from contact? Is it just dirt from wear and tear? Uh, or grime from a hundred years of preservation. We don't know uh, the answer to that question. And the possibility that it could be blood opens these questions of what this violence could have looked like. This is another handmade shirt. Dr. Taylor, I've read an interesting piece just recently talking about the really unattributable origin of the red shirt and cited the, the use by the um, abolitionists after the caning of Preston Brooks that he, he had a red shirt from the caning. Ah, waving and waving the bloody shirt is kind of, uh, uh -huh. yeah, I but could, um, I could see that. But I mean, have you? Is the term red shirt as opposed to bloody shirt, you, you believe is really associated with the Hampton's red shirts? Yeah, I mean, I, yeah, I think so. I, and I think they were going for something distinctive here as a unifying impulse in their in their costuming. But yeah, the, this you kind of hear the waving of the bloody shirt, um, which may have some bearing there um, on the choice of red. Um, but um yeah, I would love to see the article if you if you have it. Feel free to to send that on to me. I want to see what folks are saying here. Um, yeah, Tillman's bloody shirt. I would think is a reference. I I'm not an expert on Tillman, but I could tell you Ben Tillman was a child and participated in one of the massacres in 19, uh, 1876. So, um, I would assume when bloody shirt is used in the context, and I know he referenced it in political campaigns. Ah, Kim, you make such a fantastic point, and this is going to come up over the course of the next slides. Thank you for that segue. She asked, are women sewing the shirts for their men? Yes, right? These are handmade garments, and absolutely, they are uh, being produced by women, maybe young girls. If you are wealthy and have a domestic, can you imagine being a Black domestic having to make a red shirt for political violence that you know is going to happen? And that certainly could have been a possibility as well. But yes, these are made in the home. Keith, you're seeing a, a, a resemblance to the Confederate uniform. And if we go back here, 
right? This one in particular, I think this is the fancy one, right? Because it's got the gray on the end, it's got the collar, it's got some ribbing um, and gray buttons. So someone put a lot of time into this one. So each red shirt would be a little different, um, but they all would have worn red. Yeah, I think it depends on the person making it, uh, whether it would have been a couple buttons down or whether the whole thing buttoned. This one doesn't seem to have suspenders, uh, places for your suspenders to come through, but we can see them uh, in the shirt here on the, the left and right on this slide. So really it would have come down to, you know, the supplies you had. If you look at these, um, they're, they're, they're sewn with a sewing machine, which would also show you the benefits of new technology, being able to order a sewing machine um, and expediting this process. So they're kind of a modern creation. All right. Um, yeah, I'm not sure if they were meant to be visible, but I think Kim brings up a good point about whether you could see them or not. A big distinction between the red shirts and the clan of the early 1870s, which is gone. The clan, I mean, I, I suspect many of the clan members were red shirts, but the clan is disbanded by the time the red shirts rise to power. And um, they certainly don't care about disguising themselves or hiding themselves in any way, it, much in the same way we see um, at the Capitol on, on January 6th. So nice job. You say so, the plan, sorry, you say the plan is disbanded, but don't they still kind of exist now? Oh, oh so there's three uh, um, uh, sort of reincarnations or or, 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 or periods of, di of three different clans. So the first clan emerges in 1868 in Pulaski, Tennessee. Um, and this is where you get the connections to like Nathan Bedford Forest. Um, and this clan is the one that was active in early reconstruction. Um, you may even hear in conversation about uh, January 6th, um, reference to the Ku Klux Klan Act, which forbade wearing masks um, and engaging in intimidation and vigilante um, activities. And so the federal government steps in, they begin to arrest people. Um, however, they don't really convict very many people, but it's enough of a federal um, oversight that you see the Klan retreat to the shadows. But that being said, many of the Klan would have become red shirts, you know, several years later. It would have fueled the same ideology. Then you have the reincarnation of the Klan in 1915 after the screening and the release of The Birth of a Nation. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. And that's the clan that spreads all over the U.S. The first clan, Southern Reconstruction Era. The second clan's nationwide. In fact, Indiana had the most Klansmen of, of any state in the nation. And then you'll see it reemerge with the mid-century civil rights movement. Now, are there some people that would identify as Klan today? Yes, but not the same kind of pockets um, and not nearly the size as it would have been in that second version of the Klan. So yeah, there's still some claverns and things around, but I think, and we'll talk today, some of these newer groups like the Proud Boys are probably where most of your young white men are being radicalized today. Thank you. You're welcome. I, I'm not sure when Tillman was born. Um, I'll take your word for that, but I know he was he was young. I was under the impression he was like 12, but maybe I'm wrong about that. So the other thing I wanted um, to just sort of show you, and let me backtrack. I just want to give you guys a little bit of the, the quilt. I wanted to ask you all if this, speaking to the role of women here, uh, this was produced in the Reconstruction era. Can you see what's in the center of the quilt? Yeah, if you look really closely, that's a Confederate flag. So in the center of each one of these would have been a stitched Confederate flag. So we can see where the imagery is really, really important from the beginning of Reconstruction. And we even see it turned into museums. I wish I could say as a museum person that we are these wonderful, um, progressive and um, always right institutions, we're not. Um, and we started, uh, and sometimes we are responsible for messaging of the lost cause. And you could see that here with the John May Museum, which collected Confederate 
uh, memorabilia, put it on display, and you can see whole families here, right? Um, coming through, looking at pictures of Confederate soldiers, looking at the books. And this reminds me a bit of what we also know from the literature uh, by historians. A great book, if you haven't read it, is Karen Cox's Dixie's Daughters. And she talks about the preservation of Confederate culture from the perspective of the United Daughter for Daughters of the Confederacy. And so these women are the ones that built these Confederate soldiers on the public square at these state houses. They wrote textbooks. They had an indoctrination program via the children of the Confederacy. They held essay contests. They saved artifacts for museums like the John May Museum. And so they were really those that, that, that committed to the lost cause and sharing with the nation this idea that the war wasn't fought over slavery. It was a state's rights issue and everybody was brave and they fought for good reasons. But the North was just too powerful. And I don't know how many of you are native South Carolinians and when you went to elementary school, but I would argue the equivalent of what the United Daughters of the Confederacy did on um, a nationwide scale, we can see via the textbooks written by Mary Sims Oliphant. If any of you had that, I know her textbook was last used in 1985, so it's possible. Some of you were exposed to that and she's sort of doing the same thing, but with the textbooks in South Carolina. I'm just gonna check in on chat real quick. Oh yeah, the battle for, thanks Dr. Green. And we can see this commemoration of the red shirts and uh, the celebration of um, domestic terrorism continues throughout the 20th century. And so here is a red shirt meeting in 1908. And you might take a moment to see who you think is present. Ah, uh, thanks Elizabeth for that suggestion. Is it just a bunch of older men in red shirts running around here? No, we can see women. We see children, right? Providing the foundation for the next generation. It also has a bit of a middle class vibe in places, right? We can see men donning their, perhaps their Sunday best, wearing formal hats here. But I think some of the most persuasive um, artifacts that we have that show us just how committed many white South Carolinians were to commemorating the red shirts and celebrating the kind of violence that they use um, is a scene from the red shirt parade um, on its 50th anniversary. So this is 1926. I don't think the Moore is still using this film. I think they've updated some of their films, but this was in uh, one of the original films that was trying to explain the relationship between Reconstruction and Woodrow Wilson and Columbia. And um, this is actually a piece of moving image that's housed at um, the Moving Image Research Collection at the University of South Carolina, a wonderful, wonderful collection of moving image. So I pulled out the excerpt of the Red Shirt Parade and I just want you to kind of watch and see if you can notice what are people doing, who's there. Uh, you'll probably notice some landmarks as well. In 1926, two years after his death, white Colombians celebrated the overthrow of Reconstruction with a parade. It commemorated the 50th anniversary of Wade Hampton's election as governor and the red shirts who used violence and fraud to elect him. So I'm gonna jump into here to the chat. Yeah, it would not have been uncommon, um, I think, to try to incorporate Blackness in some of these videos and in some of this commemoration to try to articulate an argument that there had been loyal Black, that's part of the Lost Cause myth too, that Black Southerners had been loyal, those that enslaved loved their family. And so you want to make these arguments that they fought in this civil war or that they are, they were red shirts. There's just simply no evidence 
uh, that demonstrates that. But when you came to a commemorative moment, you might have recruited people um, to, to give that presentation. So yeah, hopefully what you noticed here uh, was the Capitol. Um, some familiar sites, again, like that, um, that 1908 meeting. This is a family affair. It looks like it could be a 4th of July parade or a Memorial Day parade. Um, we can see people bringing out their red shirts if they still had them in their family. Um, and just a general sort of celebration. So if we're doing that 50 years in 1926, um, that's a lot of memory making and commemoration. And you could already see Wade Hampton and the statue that's on the State House grounds had already been erected as well. It's a fun statue in that it depicts both Civil War and Reconstruction era. Uh, Wade Hampton, a general upon his steed, but he looks like the way he did in Reconstruction. It so we've spent a long time commemorating um, not just um, the red shirts, but the violence that went with it. And so I have not heard uh, to the contrary that um, the red shirt shrine uh, at Oakley Park in Edgefield has closed. If somebody has heard that or has uh, a link, please let me know. Uh, but the United Daughters of the Confederacy, that same group that has been preserving Confederate culture, um, maintains this home to this day. It's rarely open. It's a nearly forgotten plantation. Um, in fact, the open hours you see here were not accurate. The one time I did get to peek inside. And this was uh, the home to Confederate General Martin Gary. He was a key um, architect of the 1876 Red Shirt Campaign. And it was from this um, land that Gary rallied thousands of men wearing their red shirts. He was standing on the home's balcony and that's what was celebrated at this site. In fact, if you go inside the home, there are three red shirts from the period that are just sort of tucked away among thousands of artifacts. So these are actually some uh, moving images from The Birth of a Nation, uh, a film produced uh, or made by W. Uh, Griffith, D.W. Griffith in 1915. And this is how he depicts the Klan. And I think that this is really important because the way that we've represented the Klan in film, I think has made it easy, easier for us not to make these connections between domestic terror of reconstruction and the present. The Klan is always easier for national consumption in a film about white terror directed against black bodies. But it does allow us to forget the complicated and varied history of white supremacy and its relationship to domestic terror and paramilitary activity. So for example, if you didn't know, The Birth of a Nation is set in South Carolina. And South Carolinians who watched the film and they attended it in large numbers were alive during Reconstruction. And the film suggests that it is the Klan that saves the South, the white South from reconstruction. But anybody who lived through this period or grew up with stories of their parents or grandparents knew it was the red shirts that had forcibly uh, caused fraud in the election of 1876 and used violence. And they would have known that when they watched this film. And we see this in Doors today. Um, a film that um, does move from the Civil War into Reconstruction in Mississippi is Free State of Jones. Uh, it was a film based on Victoria Bynum's book. Um, for the record, Victoria Bynum has been in some hot water for her takes on the 1619 Project. So uh, again, you might keep that in mind. But I just want to show you this really tiny part of the trailer where, once again, we see the Klan in Mississippi, but we know that they had their own version of the Red Shirts, their own paramilitary group that was separate of the Klan. Churches, schools targeted, those kinds of uh, themes there as well. Jennifer, do you know any kind of historical background on the Free State of Jones and what how much of it is novelized and how much of it's brought movement? Most of it is um, actually uh, fairly accurate um, because Gary Ross, the director, 
uh, use Bynum as a consultant. And he actually maintains a website that will tell you, um, that will give you authentic doc documents from the period. Um, I think it is, I know that the, uh, the, uh, the, the key black character is an amalgamation. He was not real. Um, whereas Matthew McConaughey's character is. So they took some liberties there to sort of represent what the experience would have been like for a freedman. And the same thing is true, I think, for their part where they they factor into reconstruction um, and the challenges there. They, they for example, have uh, a, a child taken into the apprenticeship illegally and, and essentially enslaved and um, Matthew McConaughey's character goes and frees them. So some things that we know happened, but we can't guarantee happened to the people um, that Jones knew um, is is something where they do take um, some um, flights of fancy, I think, with that. But but yeah, they do have a website if you'd like to double check that. Thank you. So the reason I bring this up actually takes me more into the present and out of Reconstruction. Um, and for some of you, you may remember the bombing of Oklahoma City by Timothy McVeigh. So in Bring the War Home, a comprehensive study of modern white power movements, uh, Kathleen Ballou argues that modern white power stems from and was framed by the Vietnam War. It matured into an umbrella social movement, uh, something new in the history of white supremacy, accepting a diverse range of white power symbols and ideology. Following Vietnam, desperate groups across different socioeconomic backgrounds and education, both urban and rural coalesced, united by economic hardship, institutional distress, and the growing culture war. In this narrative of crisis and betrayal, reminiscent of white Southern Democrats during the Reconstruction era, military leaders and politicians betrayed soldiers who had fought a horrific war. This developing coalition rose above the country's military defeat and social and economic emasculation by embracing white militant masculinity. We've just sort of replaced the Civil War with Vietnam. By the early 1980s, the white power movement successfully combined Cold War era anti-communism, racism, and anti-Semitism into a record, uh, a rhetoric that is a globalist non-white elite were trying to dominate government. They dominated banking and they dominate media. You probably recognize this rhetoric. The violence this messaging incited resulted in assassinations and attacks on infrastructure, abortion clinics, synagogues, and federal sites. With stolen weapons and landmines from the military, members established militias. They developed a successful leaderless strategy created paramilitary camps, training with discipline, and developed a cell-like structure. So they're on the fringe, but they're bigger than the John Birch Society was. And in 1983, they moved towards what they call an apocalyptic revolution. So essentially with these cells, they are covertly organizing violence, but the way that they're doing this with their cell structure does not look like a cohesive large movement. And so you can't find a particular leader. And as the movement metastasizes in the 1990s, and this is a great uh, throwback to that Klan question we had, uh, these groups grew to the size of the second Ku Klux Klan. But it was the federal response to two high profile events that incited the crescendo of this movement. The first was the standoff of the Weaver family's white separatist compound at Ruby Ridge, Ohio, or uh, Idaho in 1992 that resulted in the death of an officer and the mother and the son. The second was the loss of 76 Branch Davidians in a fire in Waco, Texas the following year, which angered Timothy McVeigh and other like-minded militants. Operating without leadership, but within his cell comprised of Terry Nichols and Michael Fortier, McVeigh killed 149 adults and 19 children and injured hundreds in the 1995 Oklahoma City bombing. This is the largest mass casualty event between the Japanese bombing of Pearl Harbor in 1941 and Al Qaeda's terrorist attack on September 11th, 2001. There were copycats and things like that. The federal government um, will respond, but the meek federal response overall 
really created this environment where a public is unaware of the threat of coordinated white power that has been um, thriving since the mid 1990s and a failure to convict white power activists has invited more violence. The movement really has survived from the 1990s to the present with the internet. I know that was a lot, but that's sort of setting our stage for the closing here. Oh, thanks, Dr. Green. And this ends up playing out, even in the way we commemorate and enshrine the loss that happened there in Oklahoma City. So I'm coming back here to uh, the Red Shirt Shrine. Um, we can see even that connection to modern militant movements. Um, so um, thinking about contemporary right-wing militancy, Elizabeth Reddy, who was the local UDC president and part-time museum director of this site in 2014, she actually does an interview um, and she's talking about Clive Bundy's standoff with federal, uh, federal officials over grazing fees on public land. I don't know if you remember that from 2014, but she claimed to have set, seen uh, a little bit of red shirts in the Clive Bundy story. And she speculated, this is a direct quote, pretty soon the red shirts are going to ride again. Where is Oakley Park? Sorry? Where is Oakley Park? Uh, it's in Edgefield. which is where Strom Thurmond's from. It's kind of a hotbed of white supremacist politicians. It's been for a long time. Uh, for the record, two years later, jurors acquitted Bundy's son and other militants of charges related to the occupation and standoff at Muller Wild uh, Life Religion in, uh, Reserve in Oregon, if you remember that. And Kathleen Ballou, that expert on um, modern white supremacist movements, compared what happened uh, with Clive Bundy and his son to another acquittal, uh, the 1988 Fort Smith sedition trial. This was the first and last serious attempt by the federal government to prosecute assorted white power groups for felonies, for violence, seditious conspiracy as a unified social movement. In the recent past, the nation's citizens, rather than use museums to process and learn from natural trauma and domestic terror, like what we see uh, at Oklahoma City, instead are using these sites to participate in a comfort culture and the consumption of mass produced goods. Purchasing items like snow globes or teddy bears from gift shops on site to help shape their memory. Here, cultural memory, tourism, consumerism, paranoia, security, and kitsch meet as part of the public's deeper investment in the concept of innocent victimhood in American culture and a mediated depoliticization of these events. Marita Struken calls these visitors tourists of history. And so we see them at Oklahoma City. We see them at the 9-11 Memorial. And it's this process of creating innocence after the fact, as in the case of Oklahoma City, which hides the role that empire and violence have had in shaping tragedy in the United States. So for example, in Oklahoma City, the narrative of innocence, and we can see here one of the victim's sisters uh, standing before her chair. You can only visit these chairs up close if you're family. But this narrative of innocence erased Timothy McVeigh's militia and military past and the recognition of the bombing as coordinated by homegrown terrorism. So we get his execution and we get the Oklahoma City National Memorial as a twin response to the bombing itself. There are two sides of mourning, but they've erased the idea of Timothy McVeigh as this militiaman, how he was trained, these single cells, and really foreshadowing what's going to happen in our future. So this brings me to contesting elections then. This is what the straight Republican ticket looked like in 1876 if you were voting in South Carolina for Wade Hampton. It's featured in the Museum of the Reconstruction Era. So what you would do is you would come in and you'd request a straight Republican uh, ticket or a straight Democratic ticket. 
And then everybody would be listed here. You can see Wade Hampton right here. And you would drop that ticket in. Now, one of the ways that they're perpetuating fraud is not just using these red shirts at the polls, armed, scaring you into voting a certain way, but behind these sheets, I, I sort of imagine them, for those of you who are children or experienced the 80s um, or earlier, the carbon copies when you're you know, running a check at a department store, these separate sheets would spread apart. And so instead of casting one vote, you might be casting three. So I thought we would come back. Let me check this chat just to make sure we don't have a question. Did I need one? I agree with you, Elizabeth, absolutely. That we've been setting this stage since reconstruction. And I think Blue is not an expert in reconstruction. So she's not going as far back, but she sees this as something that's gone back since the 70s and 80s. Absolutely. So I wanna bring us back to Free State of Jones. Uh, and I want you to think one, how domestic terror is used here and how the fraud is working. Um, if you don't know, um, Mississippi um, actually ends its reconstruction about two years before South Carolina through similar tools. In fact, Mississippi's use of par paramilitary violence is one of the reasons South Carolina will go, oh, hey, this will work for us too. Uh, so I want you to show um, how they uh, depict their um, election that's very similar to 1876 in South Carolina. Election day, ain't it? Sure is. Yeah. They're singing John Brown's body. John Brown's body, in the brain. John Brown's body lies a moment in the grave. His truth is marching on. He's going to be a soldier in the army of the Lord. He's going to be a soldier in the army of the Lord. We ain't got those yet. <laughs> Just the Democrat tickets. We'll wait. Might be a pretty long wait. Mm. Let me explain something to you. These men are here to vote. They mind dying a whole lot less than you do. Let's see if I can find any.
And so you can see the thinness of the ticket. You can see where um, they were stolen, taken, replicated. There were lots of ways uh, that fraud was encouraged throughout the states as redemption was taking root, um, the return of white Democrats to power. I also preface, uh, Free State of Jones has a lot to like about it, a, a lot to hate about it, um, but it is an interesting film um, to talk about Reconstruction and was one of the first to do it in a way that was not negative like the birth of a nation. So I kind of want to come back to this conversation about the birth of a nation um, and January 6th. And so there were some comparisons made to Richard Barnett being in uh, Speaker Pelosi's office and putting his feet on the desk here. Um, for the record, uh, he's been convicted of several felonies. This just happened in the last couple of months. But um, there were some historians that compared it to the birth of a nation. And um, Actually, this is a state legislature that you're seeing featured here. You'll notice here, I told you the film is set in South Carolina. Uh, the scene you're about to see, Griffith tries to portray as a realistic representation, what he called a historical facsimile. In fact, he wrote a letter. Um, he got feedback about what the state house looked like. Um, he calls it Master's Hall here. And he depicts this as 1871. Nothing that you're about to see in this scene is true, but we can see some of uh, why some historians would make the comparison of the feet up to what you're gonna see in this scene, even though they were not representatives at the Capitol, so. This is one of the few times they use black actors and not white actors in blackface in the film. These were not historical incidents. <laughs> You'll notice how black representatives are depicted. There's the famous scene with the feet up. And supposedly during this session, um, you have to leave the sidewalk and salute black military officers and black men can marry white women. Those were the two laws that gets everybody, um, all of the white attendees up in arms. But this is the messaging about reconstruction that was sent out across the nation and the world. This is considered the most profitable silent movie ever made. It set the stage for blockbusters as we know them today. By 1931, the film had grossed $18 million and 200 million people had seen it by 1946. That's a lot of indoctrination. I'm gonna check in here. Yeah, thanks Randall for that comment. <laughs> Sorry, laughing in. Um, yeah, so Thomas Dixon has ties to South Carolina as well, um, and it's based on the Klansman. This is absolutely uh, correct. Um, some people say that the lead figure um, of the Klansman and the birth of a nation, Ben Cameron, is based on one of his relatives uh, as a possibility. Um, another interesting kind of fun note about Thomas Dixon, he came here in 1905 to put on a production of the Klansman, and the whole city hated it. Um, they thought it was too much white supremacy, a little too much forcefulness, um, but they loved The Birth of a Nation when it came 10 years later. So Griffith was able to tap into something the public consumed much easier than Dixon's uh, play version of The Clamson. Uh, Clamson. In fact, I think someone punched him um, at the end of the play, if I'm remembering correctly. Who wouldn't want to punch Tom Dixon? Dr. Taylor. So contested elections are nothing new. We see that in 1876. We also see really a better representation of the biracial Republican party in 1876 as they're waiting for this decision to be made on the federal level. Will Wade Hampton be seated as governor? Will Rutherford B. Hayes be the president? 
Um, and you can see the depiction of the State House here in Les Frank Leslie's Illustrated, and of course, one of the desks. And that's a cue too that we, this is the more authentic representation than what we see Griffith produce. The, da the desk even matches, right? The desk that we have on exhibit in the more. So to get us to wrap up and bring us into the modern era, in the year leading up to the attack uh, on the Capitol, congressional testimony from the FBI the Department of Homeland Security and the Southern Poverty Law Center and the Global Project Against Hate and Extremism warned that the pervasiveness of white nationalism and the terror threat these groups pose um, was the thing we should be most worried about. Empowered and emboldened by Trumpism, more hate groups proliferated in the US than ever before. Right-wing extremists, most of whom are white power activists committed two thirds of all extremist related killings, making 2020 the most lethal year for politi political extremism since Oklahoma City in 1995. The movement quickly escalated from a priority for the DHS to the number one terrorist threat, far eclipsing radical Islamic and leftist extremism. SPLC worried about individuals like Dylan Roof, the perpetrator of the 2015 Charleston massacre, who was radicalized online at home, yet served as a foot soldier of the nationwide white supremacist movement, according to Blue. In 2018, to give you some talk context, SPLC, the Southern Poverty Law Center, identified 1,020 hate groups. A close examination of the groups marching up the steps that you can see here to help breach the Capitol shows they wore military style patches that read militia and Oath Keeper. Others were wearing patches and insignias representing far right military groups, including the Proud Boys, the Three Percenters, and various self styled state militias. The Oath Keepers, which claim to count thousands of current and former law enforcement officials and military veterans as members, have become fixtures at protests and counter protests across the country often heavily armed with semi-automatic carbines and tactical shotguns. Stuart Rhodes, an army veteran who founded the Oath Keepers in 2009 as a reaction to the presidency of Barack Obama, had been saying for weeks before the Capitol riot that his group was preparing for a civil war and was, quote, armed, prepared to go in if the president calls us up. And so a lot of these same individuals or members of their group were seen at events um, that we think about with white supremacy and markers like Charlottesville, uh, when we think about the violence, the death um, of a protester uh, in 2017, same groups. And again, I wanna bring us back to the women. As you also astutely pointed out, women are making these shirts. Uh, for the red shirts. And Kathleen Ballou argues that white women continue to strengthen and support water and white supremacy. Just as they done during the antebellum, reconstruction and Jim Crow periods, these women performed for the public and press, vulnerable white womanhood and the need for protection from men of color. Like the United Daughters of the Confederacy, though far less mainstream, contemporary white women supremacists forged social connections, they shared recipes, homeschool lesson plans, they launched auxiliary organizations, and they were key fundraisers. However, their most important role for the movement, one that unified differing white power groups, was a similar cult of motherhood. Membership required that they bear and indoctrinate Aryan children, enough to one day populate a white homeland in the Pacific Northwest. Mm -hmm. Marriage, too, was key, and that would allow you to marry someone from a different white power group. In service to the war against the state, white women recruited and trained in nursing, survival prepping. They also co-owned, occupied, and domesticated paramilitary compounds. Sometimes they wear disguises and drive the getaway cars. They move people and weapons and proofread important public documents. 14% of the arrests related to the Capitol were women. And just like when we ignore or, or play into this lone wolf argument, 
we underestimate the power of these white supremacist movements. And when we ignore the role of women and center this as white men, we also do a disservice. And we can see that playing out even in my own community, in my own neck of the woods, where um, <laughs> we've had a huge number of arrests. Uh, I think 70 of the arrests um, are from Pennsylvania, 14 from Western Pennsylvania, where I am today. Most famously, the pink hat lady or Rachel Powell, who has gotten in trouble for, you know, wanting to take off the way she wears her mask, for wanting to take off her um, in home arrest bracelet. And then she's um, waiting to uh, seek trial uh, this year, probably as well. And so this has been building for a while. We can see the roots of what happened on January 6th in the Gretchen Whitmer assassination attempt. Many of the plots, whether it's going after Whitmer, burning her home, or uh, setting up the news for the journalists outside of the Capitol, these are key uh, steps that were promoted in what we call the White Power Guidebook, the Turner Diaries. Um, I do not encourage you to buy that. And another lesson I think that we can be taught by the red shirts is that the, this is, class does not shape it the way we imagine. A lot of the narrative about white domestic terror in 1876 was the poor men did it. It was mob violence that got out of control when there was violence. These were not the upstanding men like Wade Hampton III. No, it trickled from the top down. These were respectable middle and upper class participants. And we see that at the Capitol as well. There was one stay at home dad. These are uh, even in some cases, the elite. So this idea that these are poor mob uh, mentality like events um, is also um, incorrect. So I'll close with the images we started with here today. Trump's speech preceding the riot claimed that catching fraud during the 2020 election allowed for a very different set of rules. Red shirts and white Southern Democrats believed the same. Trump warned that without strength and further voter disenfranchisement, the crowd would lose their country and the Republican party. He endorsed voter ID and specifically mentioned the threat that Stacey Abrams' success in voter mobilization and electing two Democratic senators from the red state of Georgia posed. As in Reconstruction, Black political power and voters posed a threat to white power. In an echo of Wade Hampton's red shirt rally in Sumter, beneath the oak tree where the crowd yelled the famed battle cry, Hampton or hell, Trump warned, quote, we fight like hell. And if you don't fight like hell, you're not gonna have a country anymore, end quote. Then the mob exited the rally with the president's invitation to walk down to the Capitol where violence led by militias and white power activists expectedly ensued. All right, I'm gonna take a look at other 11 comments that popped up at the end. So I'm gonna scroll through these. Happy to answer any questions if I can or to clarify anything. I have a question in the room here. Okay. Um, just wondering if you've identified a connection between the use of the red shirt from previous years with the use of red for the current Republican party. And then again, with mega red hats. Not, not explicitly. I'm not saying that doesn't exist and there's not some, you know, white supremacy language within these groups that I'm not privy to, but I haven't seen anything that specifically references the red shirts uh, and the choice of the, the MAGA color. And for, I was really taken by the footage of the birth of a nation, which I'd seen clips of, but have not seen the full thing. And we have been talking about having movie nights. Well, we've had movie nights at the thing and talked about the possibility of screening birth of a nation and having some mixed feelings about that. And I wonder if you could tell us what you think the value of doing that would be or not. And if we did decide to do that, what kind of context would you recommend that we put it in? Sure. Um, I don't recommend The Birth of a Nation on My Worst Enemy. I've watched it at least three times in full. It is over three hours. 
Um, <laughs> However, um, I, you know, it's an important film and it's one of those things of anybody, it used to be considered lowbrow, um, but it's highbrow now that only film critics and historians talk about it. So it's had this really strange transformation um, and it tends to be more centered in film studies. What I would say um, might be a good option um, time-wise and just to avoid that messaging uh, is to maybe purchase um, Rebirth of a Nation by DJ Spooky. He was interviewed for our um, exhibit. And what he does is cut um, all of the sentimentality out. So the love affair between the Northern and Southern um, couple. And he just sticks to the white supremacy. He puts things like um, shapes around overt um, power um, structures and, and white supremacy and really just gives you the fat, uh, the, the scenes that you wanna say you've been able to see. Uh, but without committing to the three hour time frame and without committing to just solely the white supremacist version, right, of the story. So that might be an option. I think it clocks in at just over an hour. Um, so it's a much shorter way and it will give you a different um, sort of reading of the film. Um, DJ Spooky actually talks, I talk about this in my book. He says that um, he first got this idea because he was a DJ and he samples and he, he likes to think of himself like an archivist. He's he likes to sample from the archive, just like he does records. And um, he said one day he was doing um, a, a DJing event and he put up images of the Klan and everyone just stopped dancing and started watching. And so that's when he decided to write his own music. And if you know anything about silent film era, right, orchestras live used to usually perform uh, the music to them. So he's written his own soundtrack and then done these interventions with geometrical spaces. And so it gives you some different things to talk about. Um, but he says he went to the National Archives trying to get the, a good copy of uh, Birth of a Nation because it's public domain. You can watch it anywhere. Um, and they didn't want to give it to him because they thought he was going to like, like, make like a neo-Nazi movie. And then he was like, no, 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 this is a, an anti-Klan uh, film. And so, yeah, it's, it's a challenging. How long, how long is uh, the remake? I think it's like an hour, hour and 15. I think I actually saw him perform that at the Kennedy Center a few years ago. And um, I found it very disturbing because my takeaway was that um, there wasn't any like kind of like commentary opposed to the movie. And it felt kind of like glorification of it just by putting like modern DJ music on top of really awful imagery. Yeah, it's helpful if he if he speaks about it, which he did. Um, you know, when we had the burning of Columbia events. He we screened it at the Nickelodeon, and he came. And yeah, I think you need context, absolutely. Um, and if that's something you all are interested in, you know, I'm happy to come back and talk about the film and give you some context. I'm not the end all be all expert, but um, I'm 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 happy to to chat about it. Um, and there is an English professor um, that also is a specialist in Birth of a Nation. Um, but she's a, a film person um, at, at USC that would also be really great for that. Susan Courtney, is her name. At USC? Yes. She's the one that sat in on my dissertation and, and, and gave me a lot of the good feedback for Birth of a Nation. I see some questions. Were there any more? I don't know how we want to field questions. I see one on the screen and some in the chat. Randall, do we want to start with you and then I'll move through chat? I guess my perplexity is like uh, Brett and I were uh, talking about several occasions. Um, we're old folk and we've, we've seen history repeating itself. But more to the point that kind of rang with me when you said you were from Western Pennsylvania, my maternal family's from Central Pennsylvania, Clearfield County. And I experienced in my young teens some of the, the worst racist outbursts in my family. The last words that my, um, my uncle ever said to me was the, on the commenting on the radio was the N word about seven or eight times in a 10 second blurb. And the, the point of it is, is that Clearfield County is 98.5% white. 
and they have never seen black people. Yet there is this antipathy that is far beyond what I've seen in South Carolina. And people make assumptions about the South and South Carolina that I think defy generalizations. And I wish we could focus at least on one sort of solution or amelioration to, <laughs> to this crazy situation. I'm sorry, I'm not focused and that's not right. I apologize. No, I, but I think what you speak of, and this is something that, you know, when I was working with Susan Courtney, we talked about was the sins of the, the South, the sins of the nation, right? The South becomes the place where, you know, you put all of this racism and white supremacy and go, it just happens there, right? And then, of course, we all know that that's not true. Uh, I'm originally from Kentucky. I've lived all across the South. Now I live in Western Pennsylvania. I can tell you there's a reason they call it Pensatucky. Um, I felt both at home here as soon as I set foot. Um, they have yins. I have y'all, you know, it's, <laughs> but there's some similarity. I mean, I'm from a union state. I'm from a border state that has very much from where I'm from in Western Kentucky, refashioned itself as a Confederate state. You know, it defies a great deal of logic. Um, and I think you're absolutely right. Um, it's a nationwide problem um, and we have to treat it as such and not just something like, oh, if we fix the South down there, it will all be fine. I love to show um, the, the map created by um, the Equal Justice Initiative, which runs the Montgomery, um, it's got the columns for the lynching memorial and then they have a museum to mass incarceration. Um, they have created a really wonderful map um, that shows the extent of lynching from, I think they date it from like 1888 to 1954 maybe. Um, and why I like to use it in the classroom is it allows me to have a meaningful conversation about lynching without using the imagery. And it also allows students to focus in on what they know. And Pennsylvania has lynchings. And you might think, oh, they're in Western or Central Pennsylvania um where um the some some of the more racist folks are but no they were east coast close to philly um and so somebody finds something there um uh, um quite a bit and and i think it demonstrates this is not just a southern phenomenon it, it happened all over the place um and it really helps send those kind of messages that i think through our history classes we need to be trying to do that this is a nationwide phenomenon Randall and Britt experienced the 1980s. Um, let me see. Um, I will say I, that Randall makes a point here about Vietnam and the culture wars. One of the things that Baloo does argue is that the, the Gulf Wars have created this second generation. So the kids of these Vietnam people went to Iraq or went to Afghanistan and sort of had a similar experience. And it's fed into that and created a second generation. Oh, Amari saying he had three percenters visit on the monument tours. What? That's terrifying, Amari. He's actually very polite. Still terrifying. Yeah, I never had any strong confrontations in the house. I we always were waiting for them, um, and it never really uh, materialized. We had a strongly worded letter to the the state editor, I think, um, but no one that came in and where I ever felt threatened. Um, Stephen said, "Oh, you don't remember? Uh, look in 1995. I think is a different story. I think the Turner Diaries has really <laughs> taken off since then." Um. I just wouldn't sell it on eBay and I probably would advertise that you had it. Um, but the idea is that it's sold underground on the black market. So if you do find it and you do purchase it today, you're probably fueling a, um, um, a militia group. Um, has anyone written a fiction or nonfiction of what might've happened if reconstruction had been allowed to? I feel like that's a question for Dr. Green. Um, well, I can kind of 
answer that a little bit. Um, there actually isn't much on anything I can think of in terms of fiction about what if Reconstruction had succeeded. Um, I will say, though, with that said, if you're interested in that topic, and I'll drop this in the chat right now, there is a wonderful book by Terry uh, Bisson called Fire on the Mountain. It's actually a novella. And it's basically asking the question, what if John Brown's Great and Harper's Ferry actually worked? And the, the, hit, the, the kind of turning point is that Harriet Tubman, who was supposed to be at the, the Harper's, uh, Harper's Ferry raid, actually is there in the story. The raid works and they create a, a new Black nation in the deep South of the U.S. Uh, it gets to the interesting questions about how people think of memory and history, because in Fire in the Mountain, Abraham Lincoln is remembered not as the great emancipator, but as someone who was trying to restore the Union at any cost, including keeping slavery alive. Uh, but in terms of questions about if Reconstruction could have succeeded, no one has that I know of has really written about that. I think because it's such a hard, number one, a hard topic to write about. Number two, Reconstruction, as it's currently taught, is already such a complicated, complex story that no one's really tried to touch it from that particular angle, at least that I know of. And, you know, I, I won't speak for you, but I feel like historically, too, you know, we have this language that calls Reconstruction the first civil rights movement or the mid-century, the mid-20th century civil rights movement as the second Reconstruction. And I think that continuity, like it is still continuing, is still also part of that conversation because none of it has been fulfilled. Mm. Or it has not been completely fulfilled. Um, I see a question from Omari. Do you think the Southern Church? I don't think it, you know, if you'd asked me, so Amari asked, do you think the Southern strategy of saying or not saying certain things is still prevalent culturally, or has January 6 opened up more honest? I, I don't. Um, if you'd asked me two years ago when I first started talking about this, I would have said, yeah, I think this could be the turning point. Um, but no, I'm not seeing anything that, I, I do see Catherine Ballou, I see Heidi Berick, uh, who's head of the hate and, uh, oh, I can't remember the full title, but the hate and extremism site. Um, and she actually co-wrote in a really fascinating book that talks about, as a series of essays, um, about the splintering of the Sons of Confederate Veterans, where the more radical elements came in and purged the moderates in the SCV in the mid-1990s. Um, really? So when you say to your brain, like, wait, they got rid of the moderate Sons of the Confederate, you know, it almost makes it explode. But yeah, and, and so they've been pushing a more radical um ideas throughout even some of the groups we would think of were already radicalized. Um, and I'm not seeing, um, I'm seeing a couple experts on PBS and stuff like that, but not, not in the way that I, I I'm not seeing the, the panel, the, the, the committee to investigate that was released on the videos, which I think was done pretty well, but not making any long-term connections. And I don't see anyone, but Kathleen, um, Ballou talking about trying to connect Timothy McVeigh to where we are now, that this is a bigger problem than we imagine and they are not lone wolves. This is actually very well planned. Um, Cecil wanting to talk about the election fraud. Um, you know, I do think when you can't use uh, bare face milit you know, weapons as, as, as a form of intimidation, and we do see some of that with like open carry, and things like that. But I think this idea that the machines are corrupt or um, that you can overturn an election by just stopping um, the verification and approval of the electoral votes, you know, we've seen it, how they're doing it, the tactics evolve. But um, I think election fraud is something that's more prevalent than, than we imagine. We saw that in Wilmington in 1898, where not only they are they intimidating people, but they're going to require them to leave office early, even though they are legally elected. Um, you know, we're seeing it in Tennessee, um, which I used to live there as well, and expelling two members, Black men, not the white woman, for protesting and using a bullhorn. Um, you know, that's disenfranchising people and the vote. Well, I was thinking particularly about South Carolina, and we've had a single case of election fraud that was convicted in our state in, mm -hmm. back in 2008. And of course, during the, it was related to uh, the improper use of uh, an absentee ballot. That's my understanding where most of the fraud had taken place. Now, I'm not sure how much COVID affected that, but that's well, why you didn't see calls for the removal of, of 
those ballots because elites and and people that probably affiliate with the Republican Party in this case. But, but, but my point is that during the pandemic, they relaxed the absentee rules. But now, at post pandemic, they have reinstated um, the previous rules they had, uh, like to qualify, you have to be away from your resident uh, in the state for an entire 12 day early voting period leading up to election day. And you're required to provide the last four of your social security number and your voter registration certificate number. And it's more and more complicated rules. And I call that disenfranchisement. And we're historically very good at it, even since before Reconstruction. And the oh. voter IDs, right? You know, yeah. once you shut down some DMVs, right, it, it becomes nearly impossible. Um, and one, you're paying for it. So to me, that's a poll tax as well. Um, so th they're just reinventing um, some of the regular tricks. Dr. Taylor, you come across the term neo-nativist or new nativist. It's being attributed to people that are considering themselves the true the true Americans. It's kind of like a, a modern term for racist. And that the, it's one of the things I think it ties together with the segue from the 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 old clan to the militia is that the change in in class structure in America that Reagan in the 70s brought in a new a new dynamic that saw the deindustrialization of America. It was really what a lot of people economists refer to as the end of the middle class. If the middle class was a construct of supporting enough white people that they don't raise up against you, it was like the middle class wasn't in, in, in traditional Marxism. If you, you know, you're not middle class if you got a paycheck. And so that we now have a couple generations that don't have any upward mobility. And they're now the work that the, the oppressed white people that are becoming Republicans because they're fighting the status quo and the liberals. And so it's that kind of that shift in, in I hesitate to use the term intellectual because I'm not sure it's very well thought through process, but it's a you know an intellectual reconceptualization of your role in society and who the enemy is. And that's given rise to this new patriot movement that is um, really anti-American. Yeah, this this new this new wave of nationalism, um, and and I and I think what's striking too is just with this new wave of of white supremacist militia groups is you know we can see a little bit of that 60s 70s influencing them right. Um, and we can get, I think we can understand some of their anger at banking, right? I, you know, the anti-Semitic reasons that they're angry at banking, we can't. But when we think about even recent bailouts, right, we can see where it's stacked against you. And um, I come from the South. My, I have a lot of family that are military. Um, yeah, when you come from a place where your only option um, is to maybe join the military, it's an easy place to, to radicalize you. Um, and I and I and I've seen that with my own family um, as well, uh, coming back not necessarily where they're forming militia groups, but where the Islamophobia has taken root, um, or um, where that gun culture has become um, especially important as a as a, a means of identity. Uh, can I add to what Bill just said as well, if you don't mind? Um, I gave a talk at Shaw Air Force Base about a month ago, and mm -hmm. about Black History and Memory and Martin Luther King's rolling bow. And after the talk was over, an army officer came up to me and asked me, what should we do about white nationalism? And I, I thought I found that particularly interesting because within the armed forces right now, there is a serious debate going on about what to do about radicalism within the armed forces because they're seeing it in all the major branches right now. And it's an issue that's becoming increasingly concerning. I mean, if you go back about a decade, the Department of Homeland Security under the Bush administration released a report about um, the growth of right-wing extremism. Now, this was in 2008-9. The report was buried because the Republican Party felt it was indicting the Republican Party for this problem. But the DHS report basically said 
over a decade ago, ago, the biggest problem we face right now was not Islamic fundamentalism, it was actually right-wing domestic terrorism. And they said one of the big um, sources of that in terms of recruits was veterans who had fought in Iraq and Afghanistan. So this is again kind of proves what Dr. Taylor is talking about, what others have talked about in terms of radicalization within the army forces. And they were talking about doing things like maybe even monitoring tattoos, because that's one of the easiest ways to identify certain white nationalists. And then that, um, I don't think passed. Um, we know Timothy McVeigh was buying weapons in North Carolina uh, or and uh, helping um, and negotiating with a certain Klan group. Yeah, so the, the connection between the military, um, you know, as someone who, you know, grew up next to an army base and has a very complicated relationship with the military, um, it, it, it can't be disputed and until, and even Christopher Ray of the FBI said the same thing, you know, since 2018, they know that one of the, the best be breeding grounds for this kind of activity. And, and this was a specific plan, according to Ballou, was to recruit from the military so that they would have tactical expertise and things in the militia and in the camps that they were creating at home. So they wanted someone who knew how to, um, knew where the weapons were, how to get them, how to work them, um, and could provide training. So the part of the government that we fund most heavily is also a breeding ground for domestic terrorism. That's great. And then you you send them abroad and, you know, give no context for Afghanistan and Iraq and Vietnam was a war that was didn't have any sort of goal other than keeping the Chinese and and uh, and other communist states from entering. Well, when you can't see a clear function of what you're supposed to be doing for the state, you become weary of the state. The state has trained you. Other questions or? Yes. Um, can you hear me? I can. Um, I'm sorry if I might have missed this. I had to be out of the room for a few minutes, but I was uh, I have an office not far from the what used to be the Woodrow Wilson home. Uh, and I wasn't even aware that it had become a reconstruction museum. Could you talk a little bit about the transition from Woodrow Wilson house to the that if you haven't already done that. <laughs> I have it and I would love to. Um, so it was a shrine presidential home uh, since its founding in the 1920s by, um, it, it was initially saved by the American Legion Women's Auxiliary and women saved it um, for nationalism, a speck of white supremacy and some presidential shrine attitudes. And, um, and it was maintained by them uh, for quite some time and eventually handed over to Historic Columbia uh, in the 1960s where it remained a shrine. Um, and it was really just filled with period furniture. The home only has five items that belong to Wilson or a member of the Wilson family. So when they shut it down for nine years in the early aughts, uh, they started to reimagine what could they do with limited items. And they decided the house was maybe the most critical thing um, it's the only home that the Wilson family ever owned as a middle-class family. Um, and that Wilson was a teenager when he lived in Columbia during Reconstruction was the lens we use to tell a dual narrative. Some might call it a bait and switch. I call it a dual narrative. Um, but it allowed us to think about Tommy's world, which was largely Presbyterian, um, with some splashes of Confederacy um, and the the changes that he would have seen with Republican um, control. Um, one of the things I like to point out, and it didn't come, it took me kind of a year and a half of giving tours to make some concrete conclusions about my feelings about Woodrow Wilson. Um, and it was a, a difficult topic for docents, particularly volunteer docents to, to discuss. How do you complicate Woodrow Wilson in a way that um, is a conversation, um, treats him as the white supremacy probably is, but doesn't, um, allow space to talk about other things about his life. Um, and the thing I like to remind people is that Beverly Nash um, would have been um, Woodrow Wilson's representative in the state house. And Beverly Nash was a middle-class black man who owned property. Um, and 
this notion, and this is what really made me sort of think about Woodrow Wilson as we think about the end of World War I and sovereignty and who's allowed to be an independent nation. He absolutely understood um, that people of color could, could rule themselves and, and, and rule uh, sovereign spaces and do so well. And, and to, to, I think it was choices that he made that absolutely put the League of Nations and the idea of developing independent nation states in European white hands and not some of the, the um, colonies um, controlled by Europe. And so, yeah, he had a black representative. He was into government. He knew he was really into British government. So he absolutely understood, um, I think, what political power was like during Reconstruction. Um, likewise, his father, I don't think a lot of what I learned about his dad came through the house in Augusta. They lived there before they moved to Columbia. And it's clear to me through the research that a historic Augusta has done that his father um, absolutely benefited from secession, uh, from slavery, from the split of the Presbyterian church and was a Democrat and a, a Confederate sympathizer. We know he was part of the home guard. Um, so I, I think some of these questions we've had about Woodrow Wilson's white supremacy I think by the political historians who were looking at the body of his work has have maybe not put as much emphasis on the first 18 or so years of his life. But yes, every room in the house, back to your original question, <laughs> um, will feature um, what the room was used for for the Wilson home and then talk about an aspect of reconstruction. So they cover the local politics, they cover the birth of education, um, the 13th, 14th and 15th amendments, um, religion, uh, you know, independent black churches for the first time. Um, and, and then of course, what makes it a powerful museum and a, a contradictory to what we kind of experience in public history is there's not this happy ending, right? That we like when we go to a museum, like, oh, it's about growth and, you know, we persevered and, you know, we eventually overcame and you walk away feeling kind of down in the dumps if you've done the Woodrow Wilson house, right. And, um, <laughs> That makes it a, a challenge. Um, the other thing that has made it a particularly interesting place is it's allowed us that have training as historians to talk about why you believe the lost cause if you've come into this house believing it, how historians have crafted it, how Woodrow Wilson was part of that group, um, and how history and interpretation changes over time. And I think that's been really helpful for people, uh, particularly the folks that I saw that you know knew Jim Crow was a term, but didn't know how to define it, didn't know how to define the lost cause and really come to terms with, with that. One, one follow-up to that. Uh, I recall a footnote, I'm not, I'm not sure it was uh, which book I read this in. He was, a, he was not happy about the showing of birth of the nation at the White House, ultimately, or regretted? Is that, is that, you have any inside? So we, don't, so we don't know. This was a big question for us in the House, because again, um, <laughs> docents had issues with how do we talk about this? There's, um, it's the second film screamed in the White House. Um, his doctor, um, who is responsible for a lot of the collection at his presidential site uh, in state in Virginia, has said that he looked, you know, sort of disengaged from the entire thing. There's a crumpled up piece of the the flyer or the the program for it, and some people have said he got so excited watching it that he, you know, crumpled it up. Others have said he was so mad with the interpretation and he threw it down. Um, you know, we're never going to know the answer to that question. Uh, what we do know is that Thomas Dixon courted him a great deal. Um, I don't think he thought the same of Thomas Dixon. It doesn't seem from the letters that, that I've read that that is a mutual friendship. Uh, but Thomas Dixon was definitely into Woodrow Wilson. And they did know each other. They went to Davidson together. Um, Dixon circulated with some certain folks in late 18th and early 19th, or late 19th, early 20th century North Carolina that are going to be responsible for the Wilmington coup. Um, including Josephus Daniels, who will be Secretary uh, of Defense for Woodrow Wilson. So I think there's enough of a connection between those folks that you could think of them as similarly like-minded, but uh, he could have easily been duped into watching this and then realized what he was watching. The phrase that he supposedly said, it's like writing history with lightning, um, is, is not real. Um, we can only carry it back, I think, to 1936. So. Um, he might have said some version of something in thinking of because he loved the power of film 
that film could teach you things, but we we can't we can't even trace that to him. Yeah, yeah, the Cecil, the it's <laughs> it's so quoted. Yeah, I know. Um, and I didn't know that it wasn't true until I dug really super deep. Jennifer, I, can I? Oh, go ahead, Becky. I'm yeah. I'm just curious because as um for both you and for Robert, Dr. Green, um, just as a historian and somebody that really has to marinate in the subject to get it right. Um, and I know how difficult this material is to really do that in. And I'm just wondering, and I know you have a small child, I just wonder what this, I know this is really personal, but I kind of skew that way. Um, it, it's like you get a glimpse of humanity and it's not really pretty. And I don't know how you really process that without losing hope. And I guess that's part of the things that we grapple with since the school is like, how do you give people the full picture without letting them, making them want to slit a wrist? I know that's not a fair question, but I'm just really interested in how you all, as people that really spend time in this difficult subject matter, how it affects you personally and how you, uh, how you deal with that. You know, I get to set in my whiteness. So, you know, <laughs> I think at the end of the day, I, you know, I'm devastated, but it's not my lived reality. I, I tend to know more of the perpetrators, you know, um, or have to think about what that lineage is. Um, but I will say when I first found out I was having a son, I thought, what am I going to do with a white man? Oh my gosh, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? What am I going to do? Um, and, and, it, and as somebody said to me, you know, you perhaps it's for the best, right? That, you know, we've got to raise conscientious white men in this country who can combat patriarchy and white supremacy and these things that they can benefit from, um, but understand that they shouldn't, or at least use that privilege um, to make the world a better place. So I'm scared to death for him, uh, true, truthfully, but, um, you know, as they say, you know, at learning, you know, just when you realize you don't know anything at all, and I just trying to absorb as much as I can to, to pass on. Um, I, I won't speak for for, for Dr. Green's experience. Well, I can certainly say that um, for me, teaching this history and writing about this history at times is a bit difficult, but I, I'm confident by two things. Number one, working at, at not just with the Justice School, but also working at Clapham University and HBCU, I often find myself talking to students who have some vague awareness that there's something wrong with the world. And what they're tr trying to figure out is what's wrong, uh, what is the disease and, and what are the, what's, what's the cure, so to speak. Uh, and so for them, it's all about trying to articulate how we got to this point but I am also, I don't want to say comforted, but I also take solace in the fact that people before us have also faced similar, if not worse, problems. And this is not to excuse what's going on in the here and now, but it gives me some hope that we can also find some way to weather the storm. Now, with that said, I, I also think the attacks on history from politicians in particular have been gravely concerning because there are times where I think to myself, that the Bethesda School may very well be the only place left I can teach some of this stuff in the next five to 10 years, if we're not careful. Um, but I also think the pushback from everyday citizens on some of these attempts to censor history is also comforting. Those folks know that it's, it's incredibly important for us to know these things, not because it changes um, our understanding of the past, because that's what the past was like. And Again, going back to January 6th, just for a quick second, I recall that day talking to a friend of mine who at that time was living in Uruguay. And he said, looking at it as an American citizen living abroad, looking at what happened that day was particularly stunning to him because his then girlfriend, not fiance, was asking him, how could this happen in the United States? And again, when you have questions like that, you have to couch them in the history of our nation and how that history constantly intersects with and is influenced and affected by ideas like white supremacy. 
So like Dr. Taylor, it, it, this is not an easy thing to do. Um, I know for many of my colleagues in the profession, um, the use of certain choice beverages helps us get through the day. But for me, it's all about trying to center how this history matters to us in the here and now. And, and certainly, I think if you, if you doubt this history means anything, then ask yourself, why are Sweden politicians determined that Americans not learn it? There we go. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, and I really struggled to, you know, I was not somebody who wanted to rush to use the, the language of fascism, you know, and, but, you know, when we see things like book banning, when we, when we see calls for authoritarianism, when we see calls for um, arresting or, or holding criminal certain rights um, and, and certain marginalized groups, you know, at, at some point, I, you know, you have to say what's happening and I and I fear for my colleagues in Florida um, and Tennessee and other places where we're seeing this legislation I'm, I'm really thankful I'm in Pennsylvania but one legislative switch at the state level and you know I'll be in a similar boat as some of my other colleagues well thank you thank you both for what you do I'm a teacher's daughter and this terrifies me what's happening in this country so we really appreciate I know I speak for everybody in this call that we um, appreciate what you're doing. And that's why I love museums and, and these topics. I think these are places where we can have the conversations, um, you know, and even if they take it away from the school, I'm, I'm hoping you can still go into places like the Museum of the Reconstruction Era and, and learn this information. Well, Jennifer, if I may address Becky's question, she's been asking the 31 years that I've been working with her. Um, it, it's got to do with understanding that the repression is greatest when there are people that are referred to now as woke get it together. And so the unwoke people fight amongst themselves and suffer the slings and arrows. But the woke folks get to a point where, as Majesta was asked, and she, she asked, was asked, how do you keep doing this decade after decade? And she responded, like, I guess I'm selfish because it makes me feel good. And I, I've come at it from the same way of growing up with really good values and being beaten in jail for expressing them. That, well, I'm doing okay. I'm making the best out of my experience here on planet Earth. And I want to see something left that I've learned. So we're building on that, which it is that we just learned from her mother, who learned it from Du Bois and going all the way back of the commonality of desire and need of hu humanity. And so I'm on that side, I'm fighting a really good fight. That's what the school's about, is to see that that institutional analysis is here for another generation. And so you know, I want and you I to see... feel a little better about all this ugly stuff that Jen is gonna inherit because he's standing on your shoulders too. Or I may just take him off. I I don't know into the wilderness. Um, I, I and I do think Cecil brings up a good point. Well, they use the power of the purse to defund such museums in the same way libraries are now being cut from. Local. They've already done it. Um, you still have some big uh, institutions like Smithsonian institutions and um, that that do receive good funding. You can still write an NEH grant, but that money is so limited. You have so many institutions that are one person wearing all of the hats. Um, and then you you bring students. So I run a public history program for master students at Duquesne. We get these students in, and you know we're training them to the best of our ability. And then they go into these museums, and there's hardly any money for them to make a living. And they're like the rest of us, like what Brett just talked about. You know, they're doing it. You don't go into museums because you're going to be rich. You go into them because you you want public engagement and you believe in what you do. And um, and, and, and if this could be a call for you, anytime you see an opportunity to fund something or you know you wanna ask uh, about humanities funding among your state legislatures or your local governments, you know, if you look at what Robin Waits and Historic Columbia have been able to do, that is a lot of fundraising and they still have to host weddings at their sites. You know? So it's already happened, um, but you know, whatever you can do to support these institutions, do it. It's why I buy a lot of kitchen museum gift shops. <laughs> My office is fabulous. If you're ever in Pittsburgh, come see it. 
Well, if we've had a pause in questions, I want to recognize that there's some folks with us that we haven't seen in a long time. A number of former Justice School graduates are still apparently reading their mail. And uh, Dan Lackey, who goes back before the Progressive Network, has, has braced us with dropping his mask and letting us see him. I'm so glad Dan's here. And Greg Summers, who's just, he's my favorite Mennonite. He described Mennonites, himself anyway, as a timid woodland creature when he was our treasurer back probably 25 years ago, 20 years ago. And then he got a job teaching young Mennonites. What state are you in now, Greg? Sorry, what? what where do you live? I know you went north. Uh, Gosh, Goshen, Indiana, northern Indiana, which apparently is the place where uh, many clan robes were sewn. I'm not sure if it's the local Amish Mennonite community, but there was apparently one lady here in town that was responsible for sewing a whole lot of those. So, no oh. relation. So, yeah, you know, um, good to see everybody. Thanks, Greg. So, Dr. Green, you want to tell people what's in store? We certainly want to thank uh, Taylor for making the long trip down here. From, um, Wish I could be there in person. I hope to get the book on the house done soon and would love to see you if I make a trip down to South Carolina for that and maybe maybe come to the museum. Can you can you tell me where you got that um, chicken, Ernest Lake chicken? I was moving from Columbia here and I had a friend and I said, I didn't get an Ernest Lee painting. I was set to leave the next day. And she said, my mom used to have a shop. He brought a bunch up and um, he left a couple. I have one. And so I and then I got it framed one year for Christmas. So there right. you go. I'm jealous. <laughs> well, first off, let's all give uh, Dr. Taylor a wonderful round of applause, whether real or virtually. Again, uh, she did a great job, as always, tying some of these issues of memory to the present day. And speaking of which, uh, for tomorrow's Majestica Simpkins School session, starting at 6.30 tomorrow evening, mm -hmm. we're going to have two very special guests, one of whom we already met, uh, Dr. Vernon Burton and Armin Durfner, will be speaking about uh, their current uh, book project, um, the book that, that was titled um, Justice Deferred, Race in the Supreme Court, which is all about the relationship between race, the Constitution, and the judicial branch of our government. And this is actually a really important conversation because it, it gives a lot of the legal context what we've already discussed in class so far, and also what we're going to discuss in class in the weeks to come. So that's tomorrow evening at 630. 